many of you will recognize Crazy Cat and Ignatz. The Crazy Cat comic strip was a national sensation in its heyday in the early 20th century. It ran from 1913 to 1944. Little did anyone know at the time that the comic strip's creator, George Harriman, was black. He chose to pass for white. Understanding Harriman helps us understand the enigmatic and compelling comic strip. Following the facts and avoiding speculation, Mr. Tizaran guides the reader to the murky world of race in America. We begin with a guided tour for this interview. Michael was kind enough to show me around the Treme neighborhood of New Orleans, where the Harriman family once lived before moving to Los Angeles. So as you were saying, yeah, Michael. Yeah, so all the, these houses were all exist, existed in the mid 19th century. These, you know, Harriman would have walked out of his house here, uh, which is right where that basically where that gate is. And he, this is what he would have seen: was this, these houses looking pretty much, uh, you know, like these houses, people sitting on the front stoops, and it would have been a lot of his family members. Uh, mm. A lot of his cousins and aunts and uncles. He had uh, his uh, father's sister and her husband lived next door. Uh, they shared their house for a while with other family members, but all up and down his neighborhood. In fact, to give you a sense of they were basically you know, driving through the area where they would have walked. Uh, on dirt roads, of course, uh, or brick roads in some, in some areas. But uh, his father and grandfather, uh, in addition to being devout Catholics, were active in a seance movement. Uh, they would gather. Up to the left here. Um, Pretty. Oh yeah. no, it's right there. It was right oh, there. yeah, this this tan house right here. Oh yeah, 1140. Um, and they would have automatic writing, and, and the record still exists, or at least transcripts of the record still exist uh, at the University of New Orleans Library. And you could see that that Harriman family members who were deceased were called back as spirits, uh, <laughs> along with Jesus Christ or Benjamin Franklin or a military hero. Um, and they would encourage uh, these creoles of color to keep fighting because you know they, they were they were fighting for their lives, for their position and status. Uh, mm -hmm. You know during during this time to try to hold on to the gains of Reconstruction as those gains were just slipping through their you know, slipping through their grasp. Um, and that really leads up to the time that Harriman was born in 1880. Uh, and lawsuits by family and friends to try to reintegrate schools. I'm going to take you past another another house here. Um, but it's one way, so I can't go down that street so I'll drive up here. Um, so by the mid-1880s, schools were resegregating and any gains made during Reconstruction uh, were being reversed. And that's my, my theory, is that's really the thing that moved George Harriman's father uh, to gather up his family and yeah. go to Los Angeles, is the, 
need to get his children, uh, sons and daughters, into good schools. Because the second they show up in Los Angeles, they're enrolled in St. Vincent's Academy, St. Vincent's College. Yeah, it's just a difference of night and day. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and it's a school better than any school I went to when you look at what they're studying. So this is the Chassé house. So this was, uh, this is a beautifully reconstructed house uh, that belonged to Harriman Cousins. So certainly Harriman would have spent time here. Um, it's just a few blocks away. And uh, that's Harriman's great grandmother moved in with, uh, this, after being with Harriman's great grandfather for a very short period of time, enough to have Harriman's grandfather and Harriman's grandfather's brother, then moved in with the Chassés here, and then uh, raised the Harriman boys and the Chassés. So it's kind of one family. Uh, and then that family has gone on to be quite an artistic uh, bunch of people. There are a lot of musicians in New Orleans that have come from that family. Uh, John Butte is great jazz and soul and R&B singer, mostly jazz. Uh, we actually played the part of Crazy Cat in a little song we, we recorded. Oh. Um, he's from that family. Uh, there's this guy named Ralph Chassé who also appears to have moved away and passed for white for a period of time, uh, who was a puppeteer with the Works Progress Administration, hmm. um, and, uh, and a fine art painter. Um, his nephew, Matt Chassé, is a film editor, uh, you know, so it's, and his son, Bruce Chassé, is also a puppeteer, so that's going to be something about this family. This is, had nothing to do with the Harrimans, but there's an amazing panel player that does everything. Oh, Tom McDermott is a great comics fan and also a bit of an artist himself. But uh, um, I'm going to take you past one more site okay. and then head over to my office. And this is St. Augustine Church. So this is the church where Harriman was not baptized, but his brother was. There were weddings uh, in this church and the Harrimans all attended. Uh, the last time that I can document this family being all together before the Harrimans uh, moved to Los Angeles uh, was an event at this church. Um, and it's a historic church built for the free people of color population. Uh, and uh, during its time of construction, the 19th century was racially integrated as was much of the society here. It was a multiple-tiered racial society, so you had uh, enslaved people, free people of color, um, white folks, and all sorts of other identities. And, you know, that and those identities were shifting. Um, so what you had the rights you enjoyed one decade, you no longer enjoyed the next decade, and yeah. this legal designation you had uh, might have no longer have any meaning. Uh, and certainly when Harriman, you know, a free person of color, right, that, that, that was a very designated cast of folk, and that no longer had any meaning after the, after the Civil War, and then after Reconstruction, multi-tiered society kind of collapsed into the Jim Crow South. Um, so Harriman would have been, that's one way, Harriman would have been kind of like at the gut level, very uh, understanding of language being something so we can misunderstand each other and social identity being something that changes just as quickly as gender changes, you know, for crazy cat, you know, just... Yeah. Uh, you know, there's this one daily strip where they ask, the Crazy Cat explains why Crazy Cat is both male and female, and basically he says, so we can over and take the 
a census and asked me, and I said, well, whichever, whatever you want me to be, you know, I don't want to, I didn't want to offend. <laughs> and uh, by the way, here is, over here is a Backstreet Cultural Museum, which is a very cool place. Oh, nice. That uh, celebrates local musical cultures, including Mardi Gras Indians. Um, the very beginnings of which Harriman would have observed as a child uh, in this neighborhood, and here's St. Augustine Church, which is still standing and still used as a church, still as an active congregation. Mm -hmm. uh, Homer Plessy went here, who did, who was the plaintiff in Plessy versus Ferguson, yeah, uh, which established separate but equal, uh, and many others. After our tour of the Treme neighborhood, Michael took us back to his studio, and I want to share with you a moment in our conversation where we really get to the heart of the matter regarding race in America. Well, I look at it as uh, one step forward, one step back, one step forward, and then the big leap forward for Harriman and his family, the uh, things that the that they got, they, there was a price to pay because uh, I, the example I'm thinking in my mind right now is that George Harriman had to actually create racist cartoons in the early period, stereotypes that he had to follow toe to line. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he hated having to do that, but there, that was what, there was no other way around it. It's hard. He certainly, especially in his, you know, I always, I always, Pull back. I think it frustrated a few readers of, of the book because I never wanted to overinterpret what George Harriman was going through. It's not a simple story. Um, he put on blackface at one point. You know, it was part mm. of a minstrel show. He was part of it in Los Angeles. It was a benefit show for a, 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 a home for actors, I believe it was. Uh, and he and Jimmy Swinnerton, his cartoonist friend, and others uh, participated in it. I mean, it was an incredibly widespread foundational entertainment system uh, you know that was like sort of the first mass entertainment in the United States and, and um, you know so much of what we have now is, is built on on Mr. C so he participated it's I mean there's a reviewer of my book that said if this was fiction he would have thrown the book across the, the room at this point because it was so bizarre uh, how to read the sort of the racial activities at this time um, Certainly, there were some images he created early on, very few, and it was, uh, you know, there was a, a pen and ink version of blackface uh, in the papers that were, it was the way of drawing an African American person among cartoonists that was generally uh, practiced by all. Um, not accepted by all, uh, and there are records of individuals complaining about the stereotypes uh, in the papers, um, but, uh, but it was widespread. The amazing thing, so I, I, guess, I guess the fact that Harriman, as he grew and developed as a human being, um, incorporated some of this incredibly widespread work into his own style early on, doesn't strike me as unusual, mm -hmm. um, and certainly isn't something I stand in any judgment over sitting here in 2019, or, you know, white guy from Indiana, Minnesota, um, never having to have obscured parts of my past in that, in that way uh, to try to have my rights not abridged. Um, but the fact that even at age 22, he came out with those musical Mose comics, uh, where it's drawn in the pure stereotype fashion of, of inky black face, you know, white lips. It looks like something not, not human beyond other ethnic stereotypes in com comics at that time. There's something otherworldly and inhuman about the representation of blackface in, in pen and ink. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is no sympathetic facial features at all. There's very little except black and white. Um, but th that he created this series of comics in which musical Mose, and Mose was a 
sort of stereotyped minstrel character that showed up. There was poor little Moe's. There were, di there were different Moe's comics, and there were Moe's characters on stage at that time also. But he created musical Moe's, where musical Moe's was going to do these impersonations. And his wife's like, Moe's, I can't believe you're going to go out and do this. Don't do this. And he's like, oh, yes, I am going to play the fiddle. I'm going I'm to be an Irish fiddler. Or I'm going to be an Italian <laughs> organ grinder. Or I'm going to, you know, and he goes out and uh, he's playing the fiddle and everybody hears him play and he, he's amazing. He's a really good artist. Moses is good. And they, they all flock to him and then they see him and they attack him. You know, they, they pummel him to the ground like, like Sarge pummels Beetle Bailey to the ground and Beetle mm -hmm. Bailey's just the carpet of, you know, skin. <laughs> You know, on the ground, you know, during that, during mm -hmm. the way that uh, Mort Walker used to draw that. Uh, but Moses pummeled to the ground. There's one scene where Moses playing the bagpipes, and he's beaten up. Uh, the uh, N-word is used by the women that are beating him. I think the phrase is "Heavens a," and I believe it's spelled N-I-G-U-R or N-I-G-A-R. Um, and Mose falls onto the bagpipes that he'd been playing to great effect just one panel earlier. The bagpipes are broken, and one pipe wheezes out this line, I wish my color would fade. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just, there was something about Harriman that even at age 22, when he sat down to draw, he would bring elements of his own experience and his own attitude that could not be expressed out loud, that he could not say out loud, and somehow he would bring those into his work. Uh, which is something he continued doing, and that's why I think he is who becomes so remarkable, um, because he would, through layer after layer after layer of meaning after meaning after meaning, create a work that speaks over time um, to people from vastly different backgrounds, and this idea of social identity being something that was in flux. Uh, something that's shifting, like the Navajo, uh, Coconino County, Northern Arizona, Southern Utah landscapes shift behind Crazy Cat, um, and the way gender shifts back and forth constantly, um, that Harriman had a sort of gut sense of what that was like to have your identity shift out from underneath you. Um, and that, when he sat down to do strip after strip after strip, that's what came onto the paper. Part of what, part of what came out of the paper.